Welcome back, folks. Today I have part three of my three-part conversation with author and pipe collector Rick Newcomb. In today's conversation, we take a look at some of the pipes that Rick had brought with him to my workshop. I had worked on them and restored some of them throughout the day, and it gave us an opportunity to take a look at them pretty closely and see what are some of the things that he appreciates in pipes, what are some of the things that he looks for when he's buying a new pipe, and hopefully it will give some of you some ideas about how to refine your own ideas about what you like about pipes, how to discern what performs well for you or what you look for. Rick has a wealth of experience with this and offers his perspective that I hope will be helpful to all of you. So thank you for watching and here you go. So I've got uh, Rick Newcomb here with me again, and we wanted to take a look through kind of his pipe journey. And in the last video, we talked about how he went to Denmark and his, his transition from um, his introduction to handmade pipes, which really occurred in, in Copenhagen after discovering just kind of through serendipity a Sixten Everson and had uh, almost a a, uh, uh, an epiphany moment when you smoke the pipe. Um, so we have some of Rick's pipes here in front of us and I wanted Rick to talk through them and maybe talk about um, uh, a little bit about what you saw in those Danes then in their work and of course it's still refined and, and has improved to this day and what you've seen in the United States and around the world as well. Sure. Um for one thing, for many years I liked uh, English pipes, and I've always liked classically shaped pipes. So if you look at here, we have nothing but all these are Danish except this. This is an English pipe, and it is, I don't know if you can see the grain, it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, it's a pipe made by Ken Barnes, who was one of three founders of the Up James Upshaw pipe company. He had worked at Cheriton. His father ran the Cheriton Pipe Factory. If you wonder why I'm saying Cheriton rather than Sheraton, it's because Ken actually knew Reuben Cheriton and said the man's name was pronounced Reuben Sheraton. Huh, and like Chesterton. Yes, Sheraton. or Churchill. Yeah. yeah. He said, do you say Churchill in America? I said, no, <laughs> we say Churchill. And he said, well, you should say Cheriton. I said, okay. <laughs> But it's so funny, I get a Zoom calls or pipe clubs and everybody says Sheraton. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm in the Sheraton club. No, you're in the Sheraton club. Anyway, <laughs> so he, this is an example where Ken in retirement was making some pipes. Unfortunately, he's deceased. It's very sad. I love this man. But he knew how to find grain. So I I'll really, uh, my friend Fred Hanna is the ultimate critic of, of straight grain. I think he would approve of this one. Mm -hmm. And it, when you get a, a, a tan pipe like this or the, a blonde pipe, you can see there's no imperfections in the wood. Now, I'm not a fanatic about this the way some collectors like Fred Janusik would say, oh, if there's a little sand pit or a little filling or something, you know, that, ah, well, I, I just think if they can cover it and it's beautiful and I enjoy the pipe, it's fine with me. It's a natural material. It's yes. part of working with it. Now, of course, that's what makes a pipe like this that much more special is if it doesn't have something. Exactly. Then, exactly. then finishing it this way is really a way to show off that, yes. Mm, yes. how perfect and, it is. And so one of the keys, if you like classically shaped pipes, is to find some, here's a Yes Conovis. Now this is a classically shaped pipe. It's just absolutely comfortable. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, pipe. And beautiful. it's a, just a classic uh, uh, Yes shape. I mean, you can yeah. see it, those who know Yes's shapes could see that from across a room. And he spent many years studying and copying from the Dunhill catalogs of the mm. 1920s. Wow. And yet refining to come up with his own shape. Because no one would confuse that with anything in the Dunhill catalog, no. but mm. those who know the Dunhill catalog can also see the inspiration there. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Here's an S bang. I don't know if this was made by Ulf Noltensmeyer or Per Hansen. They're both uh, brilliant pipe makers, retired now, but it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, they were some of the, the finest, in my opinion, of not only capturing the grain uh, just to perfection, but also their contrast stain is just legendary in the pipe world uh, for just how, how incredible they were able to bring that grain into relief and make the, uh, just show, the show the wood to the very best of its. Uh, its ability. I agree, yes. Mm -hmm. This is a Lars Iverson pipe uh, made in 1986. Uh, it's a big bowl capacity. You can get your thumb 
a good way down. That's how we measure like a good bowl <laughs> capacity, right? Everybody has their yeah. built-in measurement Thumb. device. Yes, thanks to Mitch Michelson. That's right. Uh, but again, a classical shape, mm -hmm. but his own, his unique take on, on classical shapes. Now we get to the star of the evening, <laughs> Jeff Grasick, Jay Allen. This, okay, th here's the story behind this pipe. Absolutely stunning. And again, it's just like the uh, Ken Barnes where the, it, it's blonde natural wood. So you can tell there's no imperfection in this wood and beautiful straight grain with a plateau top. Look how tight the bird's eye is on this plateau. Somebody once told me when you want to think of bird's eye and straight grain, think of uh, uncooked spaghetti. Mm -hmm. You hold uncooked spaghetti and you look down into it and you see the little hole at the right, top. Yeah. Then it looks like bird's eye. <laughs> you look at the straight grain. I always that's, thought that's that was... perfect. I use this very similar illustration with people as I talk about holding a handful of straws. I mean, yeah, same, same, same concept. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So, in, in, you know, I've written a book called The Magic of Lifting Weights because I lift weights. I have since That's your was, newest publication, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Since I was 12 years old. And I've discovered now in my, in my 70s, I really am feeling youthful mm -hmm. and I attribute it to the lifting weights and the relaxed, moderate pipe smoking. Mm -hmm. And you've inspired, I mean, you've inspired as many people with your pipe books as you hope to with this new weightlift. I mean, you inspired me with both, with all three. I hope so. Yeah. Yes. Someday I hope to get as much muscle as Jeff has gotten. Oh, in the last I'm, not, six I'm months. nowhere near. <laughs> all right. So um, when, when I was working out in my garage, indoor, outdoor, so I was kind of in the outdoor part, and we have this tree that had dropped these little acorns, uh, shells, acorn shells. And I picked up some and I thought, what a beautiful shape for a pipe. And I held mm -hmm. it up. So I brought it to uh, the Las Vegas Pipe Show a few years ago, gave it to Jeff and said, what do you think? Could you make a pipe like that? He made this. It's spectacular. He wanted it bigger than the, yeah. <laughs> Right. But yeah, I remember you showed, you, you brought a little packet, a little yeah. uh, baggie with them in it and, and gave them to me to bring back. And I drew some sketches and uh, we were, and I even sent uh, some early shapes of this. I think I maybe made a couple mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that didn't make it to completion and we were able to refine it to something that you, that was what you were thinking about. And we right. were just very lucky with how, uh, how the briar worked out on this one. Yes. And then this was a pipe um, I bought. Can you read the year? Let's see. Just recently. 2019. This 2019. is number 1599. Ah, so mm -hmm. here we are in 2021, mm -hmm. near the end of it. And um, this is a gorgeous pipe. And it's the same thing with the natural wood where there's no imperfections. I'll say it again. I'm not a fanatic about that, but I do love it. I mean, sure. it's absolutely gorgeous. So. I love these pipes. And what are some things that you look for? So when you talked then, about... This is another Jeff pipe. Oh, right. This one mm -hmm. I bought when he came to my house in 2008, and he started making pipes in 2003, so it was your fifth year right. as a pipe maker. But it, it was, that was my first time visiting right. you, I believe. Right. And right. I remember walking into your office and seeing the racks everywhere, and I, I saw in this room more... I, I had more of an education walking in that room, looking at all of those extraordinary pipes from all these makers whose names I knew, and I'd seen a pipe here and there. Mm -hmm. um, I had more education walking in that room that day than I think I had uh, all of the years beforehand, just because of being in the presence of all of these. It's like being an art student and going to the Met the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what I find is, is important, I, I mentioned with the Weber, you mm -hmm. know that this is a this is like buying a suit off the rack but i had it tailored specially so by having this hand cut mouthpiece mm -hmm. um, that's an example this was a pipe i bought from jeff's a stunning pipe beautiful very comfortable um in in 2008 i smoked it many times but i was back here two years ago and i remember saying to jeff you know I just wish this diameter were a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, it was already pretty big. And I like what's called uh, a little giant shape where mm -hmm. if you look, so many of these are like this, yes, kind of it's this the, little. The pipe itself but, is not large. Right, but it has a big bowl capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and so Jeff expanded this. Yeah, enlarged uh, the enlarged, tobacco chamber. Mm -hmm. the, yes, and I, and I enjoy it that much more. So. I don't know what, I think the lesson there is figure out what you want in your pipes and then uh, 
But, but don't try to do it yourself. Find somebody <laughs> as, who's really good. Well, someone has to keep those pipe makers employed. I mean, that <laughs> especially the pipe maker. That's right. And this was a 1993 Sixth and Iverson pipe that I bought at the time. That uh, just today I brought it because the mouthpiece had gotten a little bit frayed, and I asked Jeff, "Can you, you know, tweak this so just file it down and, and buff it out?" And he made it like like brand new. So that, and now, now to me, it almost feels like a new pipe all over again. So that's why I just have so much fun with, in this whole world of pipes, mm -hmm. with the friendships, the stress reduction, the excitement, like a little kid. I've, I, I've got a grandson. I've got, I've got several, three grandsons now and, and a granddaughter. And, and they all have like little kids. One uh, was after cars. I think he saw the movie and he got mm -hmm. all these little toy cars. Another one loves trucks and fire trucks and garbage trucks and you name it, any kind of truck. Another one likes police cars, you know. So, and then a third, uh, my granddaughter likes horses. And a little, and they, they set them up. And this is like, I feel like a little kid with my little toys, mm -hmm. you know. And it's, that's exciting when you're in your 70s. It gives you something to have fun with. And These are your for. toys. They are my toys. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait till we go to pipe shows. And uh, it's like going to the toy store. It is like every day. But the yes. kind of the the beauty, may, and maybe we'll end on this, is one of the things that I love about pipe shows. And to extend this analogy a little bit, is that it's like going to a pipe store or to a toy store. But in this case, you get to spend time with and buy the toy from the person who made it. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. Also, I think we do know um, the dangers of inhaling tobacco smoke much more today than we did 100 sure. years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like J.R.R. Tolkien used to say, and he's been quoted widely as saying, he would wake up in the morning and say, oh, good, another 24 hours of pipe smoking. <laughs> right. And I get it. I've, I've, had the, I've had those thoughts. Yeah. Um, six out of seven days a week. But um, seriously, what I sometimes think of is, oh, good, another day to play with my pipes. Mm -hmm. It's like I spent all afternoon at, in Jeff's workshop basically asking him questions, learning, watching him buff, uh, playing with my pipes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time I've smoked a pipe all day is this one. And, you know, I've hardly puffed it. And that's I think that's healthy, too. That, sure. That yeah. We're all we want to pace ourselves using a little moderation here so that uh, we can be smoking our pipes uh, into, into our 90s into our 90s mm -hmm. or beyond. Right. All right. Well, thanks so much, Rick. I really appreciate right. you. Thank taking you. The time. Thank yeah. you. I'm honored to be talking to you. And so there we have it, folks. Part three of my three part conversation with Rick Newcomb. I really hope that you enjoyed watching these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them with Rick. Please do comment below if you have any thoughts or your own ideas about what you look for in a pipe, what is valuable to you. And please do check out the link in the description below to pick up copies of Rick's books at Amazon.com. Thanks again for watching, and happy puffing.